apocalyptic fiction and dystopian fiction forces us to re-examine society's problems and consider our actions and places in the world. Living in the middle of a pandemic has left us with a disturbing sense of unreality. Books and films that reflect biowarfares or viral outbreaks, contagious diseases and pandemics that used to read like science fiction lately seem to have become uncomfortably real. Whilst fantasy fiction allows us to escape reality, science fiction can also provide us with a window through which to confront our darkest fears. My paper today is based on Richard Adams' disturbing narrative, The Plague Dogs, a tale of two dogs on the run from an animal research center set in Northern England. Central to my analysis is the context in which the book was written and the fact that it was published parallel to the development of the animal liberation movement in the late 70s. In the light of animal studies and eco-criticism, I propose to read the novel as one that dismantles the supposed mutual bond between humans and their canine companions. Given the context and theme of this conference, I'll also be considering how Adams makes use of complex symbolism, combining elements from Jung's archetypes of the collective unconscious and Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. As I will argue, The Plague Dogs also reads as a mythological narrative which incorporates the magic flight motive in which the fugitive canine heroes must overcome difficult obstacles along their journey in their attempt to survive. Richard Adams is best known for his best-selling classic, Watership Down, which was published in 1972. And this book appealed to adults and children alike. The story um, is basically an animal story which uh, he uses to attack human civilization in a kind of odyssey about a colony of rabbits that are forced to travel across the country in search of a new home when their burrow is destroyed. In this epic saga, Adam, Adams develops something that we could say is close to an anthropomorphic society using the rabbit's perspective. Not only do rabbits have their own myths and fairy tale and folk tales, but Adams even goes as far as creating a special language to underline the rabbit's otherness. In words of Simon Flynn, this is an animal secondary world which both reflects aspects of our world and uses the perceptions of rabbits to defamiliarize aspects of human society. The book was taken to the screen by Martin Rosen, who also directed the uh, version of The Plague Dogs in 1982. And although my analysis today will focus mainly on the book, the illustrations that I've used um, in the PowerPoint do come from the film. Surprisingly, or then again, perhaps not, given its bleak and distressing narrative, both publics and critics have largely ignored the plague dogs, even though Adams himself considered it his best novel. The novel exhibits a deep-seated, controlled, but contagious fury aimed at willful cruelty to animals whilst exposing the idiocies of bureaucracy, the cynicism of politicians and the press. Despite its title and canal protagonists, the novel does not belong to what we could call the typical dog story, but rather to that of science fiction. This is both a stylistically complex and deeply disturbing story. And for me, at least, it's probably been one of the most difficult books to read due to the way that it addresses animal rights and lays open to the reader the injustices that animals must face. Its major themes are abuse, death, and the bleak life of the two animal subjects. As Ralph, one of the dogs, repeats over and over throughout the tale, it's a hard world for animals. Adams uses talking animals then to lay open these injustices and cruelties through the depressing plight of the two canines who escape an isolated animal research lab and aimlessly wander the inhospitable wilderness of the English Lake District only to encounter just as much misery in the outside world. Ralph, a retriever mongrel, and Snitter, a terrier, represent the escaped dogs who are cast in the novel as potential, potential vectors of biological weapons, in this case, the bubonic plague. They become the plague dogs and are cast in popular imagination through a newspaper's fabricated allegation as potential transmitters of this deadly disease and the focus of a sensationalist nationwide media campaign, so false news. This triggers a snowball effect of scientists and politicians struggling to shift the blame and the media by blowing up the whole story, which reads as a kind of witch hunt for the two innocent dogs who exist in a lawless world where there seems no point to life other than survival. 
Animals are inseparable then from humans and society, and our more than human world cannot be conceived without animal subjects. How we depict non-human animals in literature and their place as subjects in literary texts can also reflect and challenge our own thinking. In words of Margot Di Medio, what is important about literary representations of animals' minds isn't whether or not they're accurate, it's what they reveal about how humans think about animals and what the consequences of that thinking is. Great works of literature that use animals as satire, such as Swift's Gulliver's Travels or Orwell's Animal Farm, have often been placed between the two categories of adult and children's fiction and spark the debate of who the implied reader is and whether animal stories are for children, adults, or a confluence of both. More often than not, stories with non-human animals are commonly labeled as fantasy fiction for children. This is largely due to the fact that animals are given the power of articulate thought and speech. As Erica Fudge points out, I quote, we lack a language at present in which we can think about and represent animals to ourselves as animals in ways that are not metaphorical. Likewise, the difficulties of communicating with non-human beings is a major theme in both fantasy and science fiction, whether these be real, supernatural or extraterrestrial. In general terms then, our affection towards animals is directed towards those animals that are not eaten, that is companion species. In this sense, dogs have been considered the first animal species domesticated by humans, and the story of the canine has been fundamentally entwined with that of humanity since the earliest of times. Dogs are not uncommon either in folklore or mythology, and are often seen as companion animals to heroes, gods, or goddesses, and symbolically associated with loyalty and vigilance, often acting as guardian and protector, hence the notion of man's best friend. In this category, dog literature abounds and is one of the most famous types within the genre of animal stories. Eric Knight's Lassie Come Home, The Incredible Journey, or even The 101 Dalmatians all praise the dog's innate loyalty towards their human companions. Depicted in fiction and real life as man's favorite companion species, they fulfill functions that range from much loved pets to hardworking animals. However, the dog's status as man's best friend offers them little protection from being one of the species most regularly exploited, locked in cages, and forced to endure excruciating scientific experiments, as denounced by PETA. Although the number of dogs used in research um, has declined by over 72% since 1979, according to recent statistics by NAVS, in 2018, nearly 60,000 dogs were used for research, testing, teaching, or experimentation by research facilities, which included hospitals, schools, laboratories, and private firms in pharmaceutical industries. Despite the fact then that most writers and critics condemn animal experiments and vivisection, there have been few fictional works that question the morality of using animal subjects for scientific research, and even less that give a first-hand account of reflecting the victim's point of view. Following this then, Richard Adams' novel, The Plague Dogs, uses the tradition of the talking animal story to comment on animal experiments and the political and social abuse that is often linked to it, in the same line as Orwell's Animal Farm. Adam uses the genre of the animal autobiography to address the issue of our inhumane treatment of animals in a similar way to Anna Sewell's Black Beauty, which gave rise in 1824 to the formation of movements such as the RSPCA um, the, the NAV and the NAVS. Adams also draws on the wild animal story in a more realistic and unsentimental tradition, like that of Ernest Tom and Seaton's Wild Animals I've Known or Jack London's The Call of the Wild, insofar that he describes the dog's personality and mentality. In the preface to the book, Adams states that although the animal research scientific and experimental institution, which comes under the acronym ARS, which is where the dogs escape from, does not exist, all the experiments that he describes are real. He also op openly acknowledges his debt to Peter Singer's groundbreaking book, Animal Liberation, and Richard Ryder's Victim of Science. Both books target behavioral research in particular for its painful and unnecessary experiments. It was during the late 70s and 80s then in Britain and America that the discussion about animal ethics became central and Singer's book is often cited as being seminal to animal studies. As animal rights started gaining attention, the issues that the movement raised were mainly to do with animal testing and research. Not only did it awaken millions to the abuse of animals and expose the reality of factory farms and animal experimentation, 
but it also provoked further investigation into the moral status of animals and created the modern animal liberation movement. Following this, the most influential works were those of philosophers such as Tom Regan, Mary Midgley, others such as Val Plumwood or Carol Adams have offered what's known as an ecofeminist approach to animal ethics by bringing the oppression of women and animals closer. Despite progress then in the movement, especially in Europe and the treatment of farm animals, thanks to other initiatives such as the Great Aid Project, there's still much to be done. Animal suffering is still used today in areas such as toxicology, cancer research, neurological research, and many other areas which all involve conducting injuries and or inflicting pain or harm to non-human animals. Experiments such as these are explicitly detailed by Adams, who was uh, throughout his life a defender of animal welfare and was involved with organizations such as Cruelty Free International and served as the president of the RSPCA. The Plague Dog opens with a scene from experimental psychology, that is survival expectation conditioning, water immersion, which basically means seeing how long a dog can survive in a water tank without drowning. The dog in question is Ralph, a large Labrador retriever who only knows torture and trusts no human. He's presented to the reader as 815. Day after day, he's nearly drowned in a water tank and forced to swim for his life until exhaustion makes him sink. Meanwhile, Snitter, a black and white fox terrier, known as 732, has been the subject of an imperfect brain surgery, which has left him in possession of a fractured reality and vision. He was sold to the institution after being held responsible for his master being knocked down by a lorry. While Snitter has memories of good men, Ralph has no such illusions. The story draws much of its power from the psychological complexity of the canine protagonists, since both dogs are mentally ill and deeply traumatized. Both show typical symptoms of what in human psychology would be referred to as post-traumatic stress disorder. However, it's not just the dogs that appear as victims in the lab, as we discover when Snitter leads Ralph past the bird aviary, the aquariums, caged rats, the dead-eyed rabbits, and the chained monkeys with electrodes attached to their brain, all of which remain victims to absurd animal experiments, which are painstakingly over-detailed to the reader by Adams. The first stage then in the dog's journey is to cross the threshold to the outside world. In this case, they do so by barely escaping from the lab through a bloody incinerator, which finally leads the dogs away to freedom. From this point onwards, Snitter and Ralph are forced to overcome a series of dangers which recall Campbell's hero quest, as proposed in The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and also that of the road of trials. That is the road that dogs, dogs must take. They travel the countryside and befriend a fox who teaches the two dogs how to survive in the wild by showing them how to steal eggs and hens and hunt. The fox is not given a proper name and is simply referred to as the Todd and appears as a kind of messenger in the form of an archetypal folk hero and an ambiguous trickster figure. He's the aide that appears in the form of a third party during the magic flight of the hero's journey in order to return home from the realm of the supernatural. Later in the novel, when the Todd meets his own death in a fox hunt, Adam spares no details in reminding us that this is in fact a very real fox. Despite the torture inflicted on them in the lab, the dogs are constantly haunted by an innate sense of duty towards humans, which renders survival in the wild virtually impossible. As a result, it's when the dogs break free that they suffer the most from hunger, from fear and from cold. Throughout the novel, Snitter often nostalgically reminisces about his past as a pet. I quote, a long time ago, when there were towns, when there was a real world, I used to live with my master in his house. He bought me when I was only a puppy, you know, and he looked after me so well that I can't remember missing my mother at all. And I never really thought of my master as a man and myself as a dog. Not in those days, there were just the two of us. However, in this case, neither of the dogs have a home to return to. I quote, Snitter and Ralph thus find themselves walking a borderline between the human and the animal world but are rejected by the one and unable to find their way back to the other. In consequence, they live in a constant state of unhappiness. They're too human to find their place among wild animals and too animal to be accepted by humans. And both striving to fulfill their innate duty and trying to turn away from it leads only to suffering. In fact, it seems that the only way the dogs can find peace is by believing themselves to be dead. As Snitter repeatedly insists on telling Ralph, I quote, 
Ralph, you still don't understand, do you? We're dead, you and I. I killed us both. We're here because I've destroyed everything, the world for all I know. If I can die and stop it all, then I'll stay here and do that. But perhaps I've died already. Perhaps dying, perhaps even dying doesn't stop it. Adams makes use throughout the novel of complex symbolism and is heavily influenced not only by Campbell, but also by Carl Jung, as can be seen in the way in which he combines elements from Jung's theory of the collective unconscious, such as the frequent illusion to water. Jung defined water not as a metaphor, but as a life symptom, a life symbol, which exists in the dark of the soul. In the narrative, it appears both in the form of the water tank at the very beginning of the story and in the sea at the end. Indeed, at the very end of the novel, when they're being tracked down by the soldiers, the dogs believe that the sea is their only way to escape. If, according to Jung's theories, the ocean is a universal symbol for the unconscious, that is for life, the unconscious, conscience, it is through Snitter's mind that we start to make the connections this concept has with death. Ralph, look, Ralph stopped dead in his tracks, hackles rising. It's the sea, Ralph, the sea that Todd told me about that day after I'd come out of my head. I remember what he said. He said, salt and weeds, it's all water out there. I didn't understand how a place could be all water. Look, it's moving all the time. The dogs have no choice but to run into the sea back to the place from which they and all existing creatures were created so that the Jungian adventure of the two unlikely heroes finishes here in the return to the unconscious to the source of life. I quote, no feeling in the legs, cold, cold, longing to rest, longing to stop, losing two gasps in every three for a lungful of air, the stinging, muzzle-slapping water rocking up and down. This isn't a dream, it's real, real. We're going to die. Cold, sinking, bitter, choking, dark. Snitter and Rouse's adventures follow the same stages as Campbell's mythic tale of the hero's quest, like many a human hero has followed in tales and mythology. Theirs is the internal path of the mind questing for the final answer of the Jungian integration of personality through the energies of the unconscious. I'd like to conclude by offering a brief comment about the ending of the novel, which I know is kind of a spoiler, but I don't expect you're going to read it after such a depressing um, view of it. So after being hunted by humans and swimming out to sea, the two dogs apparently drown, which would be the logical ending and make complete sense. This was in fact the original ending that Adams proposed prior to advice from his editors who felt that it was just too bleak. As a result, the novel ends with the dogs being rescued by two naturalists who just happened to stumble across them uh, in the middle of the ocean. And not only do they save them, but they restore them to Snitter's master. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not that I don't like happy endings, but this one just reads more like Disney, completely breaking the entire universe that the story has previously constructed. What remains in any case with the reader is a haunting sense of responsibility. The Plague Dogs is a disturbing narrative that proves surprisingly fam familiar and reads allegorical of the current ecological crisis from a non-human perspective. As I've shown by using the animal story, Adams challenges more than the crime of animal testing by deconstructing the very notion of humanity. In doing so, he forces us to confront our deepest nightmares and brings to light a final problematic question to haunt the reader. What does it mean to be animal and what does it mean to be humane? For as he reminds us, more often than not, the real evil does not come from inside the character's world, but from that of humans outside. Thank you very much. Shall I, shall I exit the mode? Yes, please. Um, just... I'm, I'm sorry that the presentation seemed to, I couldn't seem to get it. Um... No, it worked very well. It really worked well. Oh, now it's gone bigger. Hang on. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So now we see you and we invite uh, comments, uh, questions on the chat. And if anybody from among us wants to ask direct question, the person needs to unmute uh, herself or himself. But um, while we are waiting for somebody to write, uh, I'd say um, the whole notion of uh, non-human animals, right, um, has become more and more prevalent. and. Um, Adams, I mean, when I was still teaching in the United States, uh, I was teaching literary theory, and uh, some of the English students uh, chose Adams as uh, the, the, the rabbits <laughs> to, to talk about it when the, the whole discourse was not that much into non-human animals yet. 
but so it was much more as an allegory, as a, as a metaphor for human yeah. conditions. This, this, this is a book that took me a very long time to come to read. I've tried to read it several times and I've never been able to. And I think being shut inside during the pandemic made me so angry that I was actually able to read it. <laughs> I don't know if that was good or bad, but it made me feel very angry afterwards, though. Well, you're right about <laughs> the pandemic really forcing us to face things that we usually wouldn't. And we do have a question from uh, Christina Doku, and uh, you can read it yourself, right? Or do you want me to read it while you think of the answer? Um, hang on. Thank you for the moving talk, which both myself and my two cats attended. Oh, I oh. was wondering whether the label monster applies here, given that the monster is that which is visually or conceptually impossible to incorporate to our reality. These dogs are, and their suffering are very familiar. Yeah. Um, the, the idea of monster. Um, I, as I say, I think it's a, it's a book which makes you very angry when you read it, very angry towards humans and, and very angry towards um, these issues. Whether or not uh, the humans are, are monsters here, I mean, yes, I definitely think they are, if that's, if that's the, the question, Christina. Christina isn't here, is she? She's, she's amongst us, but we can't see her. No, we can't see her, no. We can, we can see the question. But she's, she's talking in one of the sessions later. Right. So you'll be able to see her, but not directly right now. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because in the, in the book, um, most of the humans are referred to as white coats, uh, obviously because those that work inside the lab are wearing the white coats. Um, and also uh, another thing that reminded me a lot of the present situation about the book is the way uh, false news is continuously um, entwined in the story. Um, and I, I suppose it's a bit like the fake news that we have today. This is something I think that also it sort of creates this snowball effect, which got bigger and bigger. Christina says, I don't question the cruelty of humans, but the monster term in myth. Yeah, I know. I, um, the monster term in myth. Well, I don't know if uh, calling in this sense, then the human a monster is, uh, would be considered adequate or not. I don't know what, uh, I don't know, maybe somebody else would like to, to answer that or would like to, to add something about the, the term monster. Anybody else uh, from among the panelists? Monstrum, showing the, the darker sides. And I mean, in that sense, I don't know, Christina, if this is what you were thinking of, but um, it's uh, showing really the most inacceptable behaviors and cruelty and uh, um, lack, total lack of, uh, of empathy. So if this is to be monstrosity, I would agree with that. Yeah. Well, I think that there's always a human component in, in, in any monster. I mean, sometimes we form a, monsters, uh, a monster by using that which we don't want in, in, in us or uh, in, if we construct a normative human being, if there is one, then the monster is what that human being is not supposed to be. So separating the monster and the human, uh, for me, is a bit uh, complicated. It's not really possible. Uh, the monster always exists in relation to the monster, to, to the human, sorry. Mm. Well, Jose Manuel just wrote, uh, monster is always a hybrid. Mm. And uh, Natalie had a comment on the novels of Henry James, the image of the ocean is a symbol of the unconscious, mm -hmm. very important. But more important for James is the fact that the ocean preserves things. They remain undamaged, also in the novel of Adam. Ah, oh, because of the ending, you mean? But the thing about the ending is, that, and, and this is actually quite interesting, is, as I say, Adams has, had actually written this ending, and this is the same ending which if you see the film, the film actually has the, the original ending. And this kind of uh, happy ending um, is one, as I said, that was imposed by the, by the editors because they just felt it was too depressing and, and too sad, but they didn't seem to think that the rest of the novel was equally depressing and sad. So it, it sort of comes as a kind of shock when you get to the end 
and then it sort of goes on and it, it doesn't really make much sense first of all it, it, it sort of you and then when you find out that this wasn't the original ending that he did um yeah i suppose the idea about the ocean being um it could be that the fact that they preserve things they remain undamaged that would be a, a positive sense to it i guess I, I think here though it was more the idea of him returning to the ocean returning from where they came from um I actually, Natalie, I had a question for Natalie before, and I think in the chat, I didn't send it to her. I don't know how, but I think I sent it to somebody else. So maybe, can, can I ask Natalie a question quickly? Go ahead. It, it's kind of related actually to this. We were, we were talking, well, in your in your talk, Natalie, you were talking about this these artificial um, kind of robots that have been created. And I was thinking in the context that we are at the moment, maybe this will be something in the future that we will actually have then. As, as now we're already having conferences online, will we be having artificial clones at, at conferences one day in the not so far away future, do you think? Yes, of course. And, and Ishiguro uses his clone, his Geminoid, to, to go to conference in his place. So he's doing this already. <laughs> And yes, uh, I, but uh, but there uh, here I'm I'm myself uh, today. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm not uh, the clone of myself. No, 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 no. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> no but it's I don't know if this practice will be. Uh, there, there's a, a price behind that. I don't know if everybody will be able to make uh, use of of such uh, a practice like Ishiguro does, does but um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. 